tales of Kevin Doyle's climbing ability and incredible strength are legendary here in the Rockies. He pioneered difficult new waterfall routes and alpine climbing routes uh, in the Karakoram Mountains, uh, in the Himalayas. He climbed a bold new route on the north side of Rakaposhi. And in 1988, he almost succeeded in an alpine style ascent of the rupal face of Nanga Parbat. Kevin loved the European Alps and climbed there on several occasions. But his big year was 1983 when he climbed, amongst other great climbs, the Eiger North Face. He soloed the North Face of the Matterhorn uh, and he pushed it to the limit, as we will hear, on the Grand Jurasse North Face. Kevin retired from extreme climbing after the Nanga Parbat attempt, uh, but for 10 years, his flame shone bright. I recorded this interview with Kevin uh, in his home in Calgary on September 22nd, 1996. Well, I was interested in climbing. I read, of course, as a child. And um, in, in high school, actually, I pillaged the whole section from the uh, library at the school. That's where I was all the time, was just reading that stuff. And usually skipping classes. Mm -hmm. Usually would be down there with either some buddies catching up on physics or whatever, because we worked in groups in order to stay abreast of the situation. But um, then um, would just read Conquistadors of the Useless, I think, was the first book that really struck me about climbing that I really liked. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember hearing about various people climbing and so on, and then one day I was standing in my backyard, and I remember this distinctly, my friend uh, Kevin Jameson and Danny Smith, a couple guys from uh, Crescent, I, I would have been in about grade 10 maybe, or something like that, 10 or 11. And um, anyway, they, they were talked about, they were going out climbing, and they were going to do this really hard route called um, King's Chimney, and they wanted me to go along. And uh, so the, I was just, I just bought my first rope, which I still have pieces of sitting around somewhere. And it, it was a, an orange 11 mil uh, mammut rope, orange on one half and purple on the other half. I remember that really well. And um, I remember I was coiling and uncoiling this stupid rope in the backyard. And these guys came up and they were wondering if I wanted to come along on this, on this trip with them. So I said, okay, yeah, well, let's go. And I was just all excited about this because it was like big deal and I had spoken to actually my pastor climbed a little bit as when I was a kid in church um, and uh, John Hutchinson was also a friend of, of his Bill Lang was the guy's name and he, they were old timers and they would get on their fishing caps these old raggedy caps and go and hang out in the in the bush and they also did some climbing and they had climbed on Yamneska and I had these wild pictures in my head of what it would be like up there I pictured a huge meadow in the back with uh, oh, tons of bears and wolves and all sorts of things running around. And I always wondered what it would be like to climb up this face on the front. So anyway, up I go with these guys. And uh, we got started. I remember having the rope and all the equipment. Um, I had taken a, a quick course about a, two weeks before with Don Bockroth uh, climbing. And it had rained the last day. And everyone else went home except two of us who were out on the slabs in the rain. And Don stayed to watch to make sure we didn't kill ourselves. So anyway, there we are with our, I had a couple of little nuts, steel nuts, because I'd read all about this, is how you could jam these nuts into the crack. And I had some, uh, would have been yellow uh, utility rope, uh, polypropylene rope, tied through it. And uh, I'd taken the threads out by putting a little plastic steel in there so it wouldn't cut the rope if it ever fell on it. And uh, I remember having that, and up we went onto um, onto uh, uh, King's Chimney. So up we go, and we get up to the crux pitch, and um, I was following in awe my new leaders up this climb. And I remember when the new leaders got up to the crux, and it was quite difficult, and he was having quite a bit of difficulty, and I was getting nervous because I thought he was going to peel off and top of us <laughs> sitting at the belay so finally after about a 
half an hour of this, I asked the guy, I can't remember which one it was that was leading, I said, well, maybe, maybe I could try. So I wormed my way up into this chimney, and, and um, anyone who's ever done the route knows how slippery it is in parts. It's the one with the pumpkin on the top of it. And there's a, the one, the crux section is quite grotty and slippery. I recall that. So I managed to get up it. And I remember being scared, but doing it. But it wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. It was quite doable. So up we went and we made it up to the top. And I remember even the top pitches being harder, but more solid. And so I remember that was just the greatest feeling, getting out to the top there and getting up to the pumpkin at the top there and climbing out one of those quite steep rock at the top of the route there, getting on top and just that was the greatest. Yeah. And that was the, the first, the very first real climb. Then I remember I had another friend, Ken Degner, uh, who's a carpenter nowadays, same as I am, and uh, I knew him from church again when I was a kid. And we went, he had climbed a little bit, but not too much, and we went to do red shirt. And this was, I'd read that this was a big graduation route in the to the five sixth grade, and I was quite excited and and nervous about that. So we went over there, and I remember looking up that route, and it was so big mm. and so steep and so crazy and blank looking. It was just like, holy smokes, like you could really get into trouble up there. And so we went out, and sure enough, we got into trouble. <laughs> we got we got off route, and Ken was leading the second or third pitch. I can't remember which one, likely the third pitch, and went too high uh, before traversing, I believe and lobbed off, took quite a good fall. So that pretty much unnerved both of us, and, <laughs> and, uh, and we lowered back down. I actually ended up down climbing, I recall that, because we only had one rope. We didn't know that you have, had to have two, well, we weren't smart enough to figure out that you had to have two ropes to repel <laughs> these long pitches. That's, that's really the first, first, very, very first inklings of climbing. Yeah. When did you meet Barry? Barry. Now there's Your a old friend Barry. <laughs> now there's a there's a story. Barry, I would have met probably around 1978. Oh, so you'd been climbing a couple of years by then. Oh yeah, yeah, we'd both been climbing, and I remember my sister was going out with his roommate. I don't remember the fellow's name, but she told me that this her boyfriend had this roommate that climbed, and who was interested in getting together and climbing. So I remember the first time I'd, I went over to a party, I think it was, at their house, and then I met Barry, and we hit it off right away. And so that weekend, we went bouldering. And I'm sure, or actually went climbing out at Wasuch, and I'm sure if you talk to him, he'll fill in the details that I miss. But I remember slamming my finger in the trunk of my, I had this old Mercedes with a big, big steel trunk on it and it hooked a piece of metal and caught my finger and smashed it and it was bleeding and I remember bouldering and Barry said it was really easy, we were playing the game where you know you try to do this route and if you can do it then if the other guy can do it then you try to eliminate some holes and so on. So I remember him saying it was so easy to follow because you could see where I'd put my right hand all the time because <laughs> there's blood all over the place. <laughs> Yeah. So that was, the, that was the very first time Barry and I went climbing was, yeah. was bouldering out at Wasuch. And we had a really, really a fun day. And it was just like kindred spirits and you just, we just hit it off. Yeah. And you ended up climbing for three or four or five years almost exclusively with Barry. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. We, yeah. we were a really tight team. Yeah. Back, what were, what were your things. early climbs? When we, once we'd met, we probably started ice climbing together first. Yeah. I think ice climbing was the first thing we did. I've got Professor Falls. I've got Weeping Wall, Takaka. Uh, with Barry and Andromeda. This would be in 1979, 1980. So that's when you got going with Barry. Yeah, it was right around then. On the waterfalls. Yeah, and yeah. Andromeda we did the what they call photo finish. Mm -hmm. we, we thought we were doing the first ascent of it, but uh, I think we weren't. Mm -hmm. So we had a huge epic um, called the Trust Me Epic. You can ask those guys about it. <laughs> and I was the idiot that said trust me. <laughs> so. I thought I knew where we were going. What route was this on? Oh, it was on Andromeda. Going oh, on Andromeda. And we came down the back side. I thought I knew where we were going because Dick Minton and I had skied over the top of, uh, of the pass there and skied out a very nice, easy glacier. But what I didn't realize, of course, was in the dark we had come down into another bowl behind Andromeda and it was a wild, crazy thing. And there was crevasses all over the place and it was not a nice experience. <laughs> so, anyway, that was 
That was pretty hilarious. So the next day we got out. Those are the first things that Barry and I did probably were that winter. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then Barry and I went to the Alps in 1980. Yeah. It was the first time we went. Yeah. That was a big, big, yeah. what big, was big it, thing. What was it like climbing in, uh, in France, your first trip? Well, it was, it was kind of, you know, for a young Canadian with man-eating clam pants, it was pretty... <laughs> they had these pants. They had, uh, they were from uh, army surplus, and they were uh, actually a, a heavy-duty wool underwear. And they kind of shrunk down so that they had these tops that were all scalloped from the way where the suspenders held on. <laughs> and so Blanchard christened them. Well, we all, I don't know who started it, but we called them the man-eating clam pants. And that year when we were over there, it was quite intimidating, but we also were aware that from some of the experiences we'd had already in Canada that we could handle, you know, a fair bit as far as exposure and cold and all the rest of it and, you know, some tricky climbing. So Barry climbed in painter pants that whole summer, um, cotton painter pants, which of course were not the best when they got wet, mm -hmm. and we climbed with double 11 millimeter ropes. Um, all the Europeans, of course, we were, we, we'd adopted the European method However, we just hadn't figured out that you should use eight and a half or nine millimeter ropes rather than 11 mil. Yeah. And of course, when they got wet, which they always did, because we did had nothing, we had no knowledge of ever dry ropes. We were like, what's ever dry? And um, so we 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 got a fair workout while we were over there. And it was that was the year of the Resemblement. Yeah. John Lachlan was over there, and uh, Dwayne Congdon, mm -hmm. and um, they had done the Jackson Shea on the Duat and recommended it to us and that's why we ended up doing it. And that was a very difficult climb. The conditions were very were very slim. The ice was very thin and I remember you know being some of the first high end mixed climbing probably that I'd that I'd done was on that route. Barry got nailed in the nose, didn't he? I was just one? thinking about that. I was wondering if you were going to ask about that. Um, we were high on the route uh, on the ice where the ice was better. But of course it's very cold because we've been climbing we started climbing would have been about nine o'clock at night and climbed through the night, basically. So it would have been just at dawn when we were coming up past the difficulties. We climbed the crux in the dark by headlamp, which probably it probably wasn't that hard, <laughs> but it certainly seemed hard, you know, in total darkness and patchy ice and so on. And uh, then we got up higher. Barry was belaying this one pitch, and I remember kicking off a big, big dinner plate, and I screamed down at him, but it was already too late. And it nailed him right in the bridge of the nose. And I have quite a good picture of Barry after the fact, looking quite cranky with me up in the campground back at the Beaulieu where we stayed. And uh, he, his nose is quite chopped up looking. Yeah, there must have been blood all over the place. Yeah, 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 it was, yeah that was scary. That scared me because I, I was, that was the first time I'd ever been on a climb where someone had been reasonably seriously hurt. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, worried about getting off and, so on, getting him off, yeah, making sure he'd be okay. Yeah, but he was okay and climbed well, he, out of it. He was fine. He's a tough yeah. old buzzard. Yeah, so that's he right. was just fine. Did, did, did you talk with Lachlan and Congdon much? That's well, we were over there. Yeah, well, yeah, we ran into them on the top of the Col de Monte uh, when we were going the first time into the Argentier. That was the time when we did um, the court, and we did that on your recommendation because mm -hmm. you and I remembered seeing that lovely picture that you took of Lloyd McKay, was it, mm -hmm. on the front of Climbing Magazine, and I thought I have to do that route. Yeah. And of course, it re didn't resemble that at all when we were on it. It was more, a little more snow and ice on it, and it wasn't quite that rock pitch, that mixed pitch, where you took that that beautiful picture. Yeah. But anyhow, that's where we met them, and we talked with John up there, and that's when he recommended they just come back from doing the Jackson Shea on the Duat. And so he was recommending it to us. Yeah. And they were gods to us, those guys. Really? Oh, yeah, we just... Well, of course, until we did the Jackson Shea, they were gods. <laughs> <laughs> and they were human beings. Well, yeah, then we realized that that they weren't gods. <laughs> but it was just another route, a good, yeah. good hard route. So back in Canada, then, the next winter, I guess, uh, that'd be the winter of 80-81, was mm -hmm. the winter you and Barry really cleaned up. On the ice climbs. Yeah, we had a big year that year, and um, I'm showing 
I'm, I'm remembering here and showing on my list here, which I kept faithfully because of all the expeditions. That's the only reason I ever wrote a list, because you have to have this for your expeditions. Yeah. When you're young, you know, and they don't know you and they can't figure out if you can climb or not, you have to say, well, I did this, 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 and this. Yeah. So it's that old, that old game. But anyway, we did the weeping wall right hand, which is easy. Guinness Stout, all sorts of easy stuff, relatively easy stuff, which of course was desperate for us. And we did the second ascent of White Man Falls that winter with Stu Broker and Mike Garbett. And we did Polar Circus, and it was 12 hours road to road. And I'm pretty sure that was the first uh, one day ascent. However, I think there's some Americans uh, that might dispute that. But I remember we soloed the whole thing except for the upper six pitches. Mm -hmm. And that was the only place we roped up. Yeah. So and of course people have soloed the whole thing now, so it's not such a big deal. But in the time it was, it was a big deal for us because yeah. we'd never done the climb, and so that was our our first crack at it. So it was good, good adventure. After we did Takaka, that was a big turning point because I remember doing Takaka road to road in a day, and I, I think it was the winter before that that we'd done that. But I remember thinking, you know, well if we can do that then you know maybe maybe we can try these other things and I think because that was a really grueling trip I remember that and it was bad weather and all the rest of it and so we had spin drift avalanches the whole day and I mean you know the climb how the first bulge thing can be quite tricky and I remember after we got up there and then following the rest of the climb uh, following the route up how that particular climb I think was the pivotal point which led probably to these other climbs. Because then the next winter we felt more confident to try these larger routes, mm -hmm. knowing that if we could, you know, it wasn't that bad. I mean, you got uncomfortable, and but you weren't gonna die. And we were just just really, really, really filled up with climbing. You know, yeah. that's what, those are lives. What did you do in Yosemite? That, what, what summer is that, 81 or 82? That's uh, the summer of, fall of 81. Fall of 81. Fall of 81 we were down yeah. there. And we bivvied on the Salafay, on the head wall. Well, Barry bivvied in the hall bag, and I, I kept, I always say to this day, and it still still seems this way to me, that he was like Rusty in The Friendly Giant. When the guy gets up in the morning, and we look up, way up, and then, and then uh, he gets this little bag out, and there's this little character in there, Rusty. And he says, let's see what's Rusty, uh, what Rusty's up to this morning. <laughs> And then he gets into the bag and he looks in there. And that's how I felt with Barry in that silly hall bag. And of course, I was stuck there in my seat sling. And I sort of draped my sleeping bag around myself, hung my chin in a sling. And that's how I slept all night. And um, we heard people laughing uproariously down the parking lot late at night with lights going on and things sort of lights flickering and pointing up towards us. So they must have seen our lights up there. And um, perhaps if they were climbers, they knew exactly where we were bivvying and what a stupid place it was to bivvy. How, how did you end up uh, there and not on the ledge at the top or the bottom of that wall? Well, because we were silly. We were just, I, I, um, I think Barry had talked about staying at the ledge below, but I was impatient and I wanted to get up to Long Ledge. Well, we got onto the head wall and it was quite a bit more difficult than we'd expected. And I remember I led over the roof and then there's a station right there. And nowadays, you've got a picture of that guy, what's his name, from the German guy, who climbs, you know, 523 or whatever in long leadouts. He's got a picture of him on the front of one of the recent climbing magazines where he's, he's freeing up that section. And he's got the other guy belaying down below. Anyway, we were slowly aiding our way up this section. It was getting dark, and I had this, the stance set up there. The, the wall over degree, um, overhangs something like... I think it's 115 degrees or, or 105 degrees, 115 degrees, something like that. Anyway, and there's one thin crack that runs up through it, if you've ever seen the pictures of, uh, of that pitch. So I get settled in there, and it's getting dark, and I'm determined to make this long ledge. Well, what I didn't realize was there's actually two pitches to long ledge anyway. It looked like it was just there. And so Barry started leading. He didn't want to do it, but I'm like, come on, come on, let's do it. You know, we got to get out of here. This is a bad place, blah, blah, blah. So... Up he goes, and then at one point he stuck his hand into a crack and his bat hissed at him quite loudly, <laughs> and he just about popped off. So anyway, down he came, and we set up our, our bivy in that, that location there. In the morning when we woke up, in addition to having the rusty thing going, 
it, it was a clear blue sky. And I looked out, and there's all this water coming down. And I thought, what's going on here? Is it raining, or what's the deal? And then suddenly, it dawned on me, and I looked up, and there's these guys up there having a whiz off a long ledge, <laughs> and it's blowing around in the wind and coming very close to us. So we're screaming up at these guys, and they're laughing their heads off up there, of course, because they're on top, pissing on us. And uh, so that was pretty funny. Oh, but right. I'll never forget Barry, though, in that hall bag with, with just his head sticking out. <laughs> it's the best. I, I don't have a picture of it, but it was the absolute best. 1981. Was it 81? That, that I have here. We did the Cassine Ridge. Yeah. You know, Alpine style in six days. During in six a days. Huge storm. Yeah. And we went with a couple other fellows who shall remain nameless. And um, they decided that they didn't want to continue. Uh, they weren't comfortable with, with the whole feel of the thing. And so we, Barry and I, ended up going, just the two of us. And it was a really good trip. We had a really good time. McKinley was a good preparation because up to that time it was a quantum leap ahead of anything we'd done as far as conditions. The climbing was not all that difficult. Um, it was just the first big high altitude climb that we'd ever done. I remember up top, well we, we topped out in a storm in the middle of the blizzard and then we came down the other side. I had these stupid ski poles that I dragged all the way up the route amongst other stupid things. and. It came down the, off the top of the thing, and we'd reached it in a total blizzard, and it was just getting dark that night. And um, found the trail, barely, because you could, there was, you know, the steps that got frozen in that deep, and the wands were all snapped off from the wind, and you, that's all you could follow, and you could hardly see, and it was all whited out. So I grabbed my ski poles and start trundling down, and immediately, about like 20 feet later, I go flying off the one side of the ridge into God knows what. And I'm just like, holy shit. Down I went, like about 15 feet, 20 feet, but into soft snow and just poof, landed and that was that. So Barry's laughing his head off up on the ridge and I'm just cursing away because I'm terrified. And um, so I threw those ski poles off the other side. <laughs> so they're, they're stuck. I think I might have carried them down, I can't remember, but I, I, I threw them somewhere at that point and I might have retrieved them, I don't remember. Yeah. But um, that was a really stupid thing. And that's all from watching Reinhold Messner. So that just goes to show you don't watch the greats because you may not have the same technique as they do. <laughs> so ever since I got rid of those silly poles, I've been fine. So, But I remember coming down from there. We camped out on the Farthing Horn at 18,500 feet, and uh, we were lost. We had no clue of where we were. We were on an ice shield. We were way exposed to the elements, and there was a huge blizzard blowing. I recall getting into the tent, and, you know, your hands would be numb, and then you'd warm them up, and then you'd go outside, try to hook up another section of the fly or whatever it was that we were doing. And I remember watching my hands in my headlamp, turning white and it would take about maybe five seven seconds and they'd be white up to the knuckles and then in another five seven seconds say 15 20 seconds total they'd be white right up to the end of the fingers and of course they're useless then so into the tent you'd go and bang them back into life and, and then do it all over again and it took us quite a few of those go-rounds to to get our tent set up Simon came to the door and I'd met Simon down in Peru a few years earlier. So he said, okay, well, Kev, what do you think about doing the Crow's Spur? Uh, weather looks like it'll be good for a few days, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, oh boy. Okay, 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 let's go. So, so I got talked into that one. And off we went, and it was quite warm, I remember, going up there. And we went up to the, to the uh, hut there. I can't remember the name of the hut. The one up below uh, the giraffes there on the left. Le Chau. Le Chau. Yeah. There was a couple of girls, French girls, staying up there taking care of the place, playing African bongos all the time. So we hardly slept. They were up till like all hours of the night, drinking pastis and whacking away on these stupid bongos. So early the next morning, whatever time, 1 o'clock or 12 o'clock or something, up we got and trundled over to the base. Lots of fresh snow. Um, easy Scottish type mixed, mixed ice climbing up the one side of this buttress. And then suddenly came out on the top of this blank buttress. And then suddenly it was really pretty serious mixed climbing right away. And I remember, I remember belaying numerous times, a couple times for sure, uh, off, of, off of an ice axe, a single ice axe driven into a crack, 
my, my ice tool driven in by my hammer, so the axe would have been and then tied off, sling, that's it, that's the belay. We had some pegs, but they would have been used up on the pitch, climbing. So when I got to the belay, nothing. And we were underprepared for the route. Um, it was a very nerve-wracking because there was no really secure blaze on the whole thing. We climbed up that day, we did some difficult mixed climbing, uh, patchy ice, long extensions, real big stretches, you know, dry tooling <laughs> for the boys that are really, really hep on that these days. And, um, and then we bivvied that night and then it started storming. And then I remember in the morning getting up, everything was just coated. And it was sloughing snow all over the place. We were really close to the top. There's a, you go up, uh, basically follow up the buttress. Then you you gain, you gain a, a snow field. Then we did the mixed bits with the patchy ice. And then you gain a long ramp that goes up to the left, and it tops you out on a, basically the top of a pillar, which is just below the final headwall. And um, there's two ways up there. The left hand variant was just full of snow. It was really overhanging, and, and it looked really ugly. And so I foolishly chose the right-hand variant, which looked better because it was lower angle, but there was no belays, no holds. It was all down sloping rock. It was really, really tricky climbing. And then it blanks out at the top and goes into a big corner, which is, if it were dry, would be difficult rock climbing. Like, really difficult. I don't know how hard... And, and loose rock and all the rest of it. But the one pitch, the single pitch that stands out in my in my whole life of climbing occurred right there. We, we came across and I did a couple of pendulums off of friends uh, because there was just no other way of getting over there. And I did a tension traverse, ended up over on this little thin section of ice with a few rock spikes sticking out of it. He ended up belaying off of a rock spike that stuck out about maybe an inch or so, maybe an inch, three quarters of an inch or so, and just chopped a little bit in behind it, and uh, that's all you had, and it was like about maybe four inches wide, draped sling over it, sat it down there really nicely and got my weight on it, and then there was another one like that, only not quite as good, just above it, so we, we I hooked that up in, in tandem. So then I remember uh, Simon came over, and he saw the belay, <laughs> and he went, okay, and it was pretty serious, and I remember getting him all settled in there, and then I headed out off up the pitch, and then it went up into this overhanging section, and there was an old rusty pin there that was half pulled out, and um, broken slings and all the rest of it, so you could see that some people had probably croaked there. So up, up we went, up I went, and then I remember getting to the one point there and it, uh, it was dead vertical and then there was just a little bit of flakes and stuff some of it loose some of it not on the left it was up about 80 feet had that one crappy pin about maybe 40 feet below me at the po at that point and then then the really hard stuff started and it just it just it was another 60 feet of that stuff and I remember it, the only time in my life climbing where I was totally able to step outside myself and uh, just climb. And I knew, I knew without a doubt that if I made one error we were both dead. We were both absolutely and unequivocally dead. And um, and it was really cool. It just, it just, everything, all the nervousness just faded and I just, just climbed. You know, and it's just like, suddenly it's just like this, well not a warm feeling but like a, uh, comfortable, relaxed feeling just washed over me and then I just knew I'm going to do it. And I just did it. And the Iger, uh, yeah, we didn't talk about the Iger too much. Uh. Mm -hmm. No, the Iger was good. The Iger, um, again, a partner who hadn't climbed too much. Uh, in, in fact, it was his first alpine climb. Um, Steve Briggs, he was a character. Good guy, excellent rock climber. And... Um, Strong, quite strong. So, we uh, we headed out early. I remember and um, soloed up to the difficult crack. Then we got lost on the difficult crack and did part of I don't know the Polish direct or some stupid thing. It was really hard. It ended up being like five ten mixed climbing or something on, with crampons. 
Then we found our way back on, went across, and you know, the whole up across. I remember just so classic though, because yeah. you, you think about all the stories as you're climbing it, because you just think, I'm climbing up into history, you know, and it's like whatever else I've climbed, it doesn't really matter because, uh, and I'm about to find out what it was, sort of what it was like for those guys. A little disappointing on the ramp because um, you had to be careful to avoid all the fixed ropes that were there from filming and all the various things that have gone on there. But we never touched one. We, we did it all without any of their, their their things, whatever. Then we had the best bivouac, just totally neat bivouac, where we found just below that waterfall pitch, we found a little slot where you could just park two butts and our packs on either side. And it was in a sort of a chimney. We'd just come up this chimney. But you could look down through the chimney and see the lights of Klein and and what's that other town that's close to there? Grindelwald. Grindelwald, yeah. You can see see both of them. And and it was such a nice clear night that night. And it was such a neat feeling. That was that was actually still, again, to this day, I think one of the, from a historical sense and from how I felt on the climb, uh, from a point of feeling a complete experience of what I dreamed about as a child, about climbing, that was to this day probably the the most complete climb I've ever done. It wasn't hard. Uh, it was hard enough, plenty hard, but it wasn't desperate. Uh, I remember the next morning getting up and I knew that the waterfall pitch was going to be one of the easiest ones and of course it used to be the hardest because of the gear, because of the equipment we had and it was just sort of, wow, that's really interesting. Uh, it just gives you a total respect for the people who climbed that peak, the first ascensionists. And um, I remember getting up onto the, well, you go up from there, you go into the fourth ice field and a little tiny one, and then you cross across, go up a, a crack above the brittle ledge. And um, there was a, a set of two friends, a pair of friends in there, number two, two and a half. So, of course, Bonehead puts a number two, two and a half friends in there, friend in there. Up I go. I hear Steve starting to climb. Shit, 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 he's cursing away down there. What's going on? Oh, yeah, well, your friend walked into the back of the crack. Well, fancy that. So we pulled the rope through, and there's now three friends up there. So then got up to the top of the spider, and then the exit cracks, which, you know, were good climbing, but not intensely difficult or anything, and, and hard enough, plenty hard. And um, the caliber of the climb was, was much higher than I thought it would be. And... Um, you know, considering that the, the difficult pitches, we're not that great at climbers. Because our, our, the, the easy pitches that we did were just because of the gear. And the, and the rock pitches where you can't fake it, you have to climb it. They were very hard. They were, they were plenty hard. But I remember getting back down from the Eiger and writing cards to all my friends. And Chick, you were the first one that I wrote a card to. Were you? you was the I? very first oh, that's one. That's great. Well, I tell you, I've saved that card. I think I drew a little picture on it. You drew a, picture, <laughs> a little a little stick man on the top waving the flag. <laughs> yeah, that and, was... And that's preserved. I have a book, a, a big scrapbook, in which I have postcards from Dougal mm -hmm. after the Southwest Face and mm -hmm. various things. And I got your mm -hmm. postcard from the Iger there is, mm -hmm. is in my book. Yeah. Rakaposhi is the next one I can think of. 1984, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's good, pretty neat. It's a very complex big mountain, that one. Yeah. Very complex mountain. It's got the ridges and got those really wild cornices where you're like, <laughs> all over the place. And you're weaving through them, going under over top and hoping it won't fall off and all that kind of stuff. Then there's the big ice cliff up near the top where we had Camp 5. And then above that, it turns into the really big blank top of a a pyramid summit pyramid type thing of a high mountain where you got the weather you know weather situation and but of course they got the rock pyramid at the very top of that mm -hmm. that rock pyramid was pretty hard back to a couple of days before which where was it on the no it was on the first attempt the first attempt I'd lost a bunch of stuff because I got caught in a small avalanche well it didn't feel small at the time but it took me off pretty good and ripped my pack. I mean, I, I think I must have escaped out of the pack, just gotten out of it, because I didn't feel comfortable with with it. And, you know, the swimming motion thing and all that. But they the boys caught me on the rope. I remember that. And um, But the, there was a stove gone, some fuel, um, my sleeping bag, and a whole bunch of stuff gone. 
and I remember staying up there and guys were lending me little bits and pieces and I was sort of you know sleeping in between a couple guys to stay warm and then uh, we tried the first time went across it was way too heavy snow and it was really avalanche really bad conditions that was with Greg Cron and Barry Blanchard and myself and um, came back and then we all went down because it had just been storming really puking on us for about a week and um, got back down and we were we were already physically quite quite a bit of a mess I think at that point we were quite done in already rested for a week went over to uh, the other side of the valley to Karimabad for a couple of days and this and that and then, then that's when we I think we'd rested up for about a week and then that's when we went back up yeah. but the second time at the top um, I remember getting up in the morning and I was feeling horrible and then so the boys dragged me up the first part and um, and then we got up onto the ridge and I was starting to feel better and then the hard climbing came which they were already out in front so they Barry and Dave led all that it's like five usual five nine eight two eight three in that range I think they put out pretty hard for that section so they were feeling bagged then and of course then I was all fresh so so it worked out really well and I was I was able to to sort of keep the ball rolling keep us going and of course at the top of that we all had a big lightning storm and we, we all got knocked down about each of us probably three times a piece I would say I know myself I got knocked down three times and I can remember two or three times a piece for the other guys just by small strikes of static of lightning and um, got up to the top the wind is blowing by the top and um, we'd fought our way up there and it was this black little pyramid of rock sticking up because there's a big rock face on the front facing the valley but we at this point we were just around the backside weaving up through the easier terrain and um, got up there and tried to touch the top we're like probably two three feet below the top put your hand up boom, you get knocked down and and then so one of us would try it and then ooh, we'd crawl away and, and then the other guys well okay let's try it and then boom same thing and uh, this was in addition to get the, getting the you know the random strikes that had happened before so that was a pretty intense day mm. that was a pretty intense day I think we climbed the peak <laughs> because <laughs> I mean we were like all three of us plastered around that top getting as close as we could to it and getting knocked down and, and couldn't quite reach up to, to touch the top rocks so I, I'd say that counts Why were you so passionate there for about 10 or 12 years you, uh, you, you were the most uh, wound up passionate climber that Canada's ever seen hmm. I don't know about that but, um, well, it was a big dream, big dream, and um, just important, important to put everything into it, you know, if you got a big dream, you got to put everything into it, otherwise you don't get your big dream. In fact, with anything that I've ever done, you don't get anything out of it unless you put in 100%, and if, or you know, like maybe 99.9%, .9%, then you start getting something out of it. But it's to put genuinely 100% into something, which I've only done a few times in my life, one of them being that climb on the crows. Put 100% into that. 100%. No barriers at all. And that was something that we all try to uh, strive towards, I think, during our lives. And I think it was just my path. You know, it was my track was the mountains and uh, helped me figure out basically who I was. Um, so that's what I was doing with climbing. Was, was using it to, to become something or to be someone, more to become. And, um, and I think that's even different, uh, that, that feeling is even different than using it to be somebody. I never climbed to be somebody. I wanted to become something, though, that I wasn't yet. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, in answer to the question, that's why, that's why I did it. Climbing is a totally good vehicle because it presents you face to face with all your failings at once, all the potential failings at once. Um, only, only it's much more simplified. You know, it's not like life. Life's very complicated, whereas climbing is very simple. It's very cut and dry. You climb or you fall. You don't hurt yourself and you have a good time, or you hurt yourself and you have a really bad time. You know, or you kill yourself. And I think that risk, that risk part of it, is the important part of it. 
but anyway, that's that's what it was for me. It was a track, a, a, a path, just a trip through, you know. But I look forward some time to clearing off my slate and not having to work for money to survive so that then I can decide what I want to do. Yeah, maybe it'll be climbing, or maybe not. Might be something totally different. Don't know. And I, I, I hate to get trapped into always having to do something because then it loses its real its freshness. You know, so back to the original question, 12 years. That's why I was so passionate because it was fresh for me for those 12 years. Every time I went out, it was totally fresh for me. And I think especially those big adventures are the things that I really loved. And we've talked about this lots. It's those big stories that you write for yourself as you're going, you know. And that's, that's the romance of it. And that's the most important part of the whole climbing thing to me is that whole historical, romantic story that you're writing for yourself.